Greetings, Shalom. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing the historical, biblical, exegetical, systematic, and integrative methods of doing theology, and also defining subject areas within systematic theology. Each of the following methods of doing theology has its strengths and weaknesses. When taken alone without a proper balance and combining all the methods together, overemphasis can cause error. So the challenge is to have the right balance of each of these so that they can work together so that it can have, you can have balanced teaching. So the first area of theology that I'd like to address is historical theology. That is defined as a study of the history of theological reflection and doctrinal formation since the first century AD. It's always exciting to me to see what others before us have believed as we seek to grow in the grace and understanding of God. We all have our heroes of the faith. Charles Spurgeon, G. Campbell Morgan, A.W. Tozer, Fanny Crosby, Amy Carmichael, Jonathan Edwards, James Hudson Taylor, and many more. It's very interesting to see how different doctrinal points have developed over time and how people built on the understanding of others. We also see many great Bible teachers who nailed it in some spots and just got it wrong in others. That continues to this day. I certainly don't claim to have everything all figured out. Biblical theology is defined as a book-by-book -book study of the theology of the Bible, including careful consideration of the theological, historical, and cultural context in which the book was written. The literary genre of the book, the author's intended message, and the meaning derived from that message by the original audience. It's very enlightening and exciting to see the great teachings of the Bible arranged according to their chronology and historical background. Biblical theology shows us the unfolding of God's revelation as it progressed through time. Biblical theology usually focuses on a particular period of time, such as the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, all the way up to the Kingdom Age, the Babylonian captivity, God's future plans for the world, and everything in between. A very valuable tool for this is the chronological Bible. Our Bibles are not in sequential order, so the chronological Bible helps us to understand the timing of the scriptures and how they're related to each other. It's kind of like a timeline. The traditional order of scriptures jump back and forth to different time periods, so it is a challenge for us to put it all together in the way that the events actually happened. Biblical theology lets us see the Bible as a whole instead of just organized doctrinal bullets. The weakness of biblical theology is that our biases have influence on the way that we interpret the scriptures. Biblical theology is dependent on the hermeneutics we use. We all have denominational leanings that we've been taught, and we all bring that baggage to the table. And even though theology is great, and I love it, it's also good to put the commentaries down and the theology down and just read your Bible and let the text speak for itself. That's what I'm trying to do these days, and I'm finding it really, really hard to not project my doctrinal leanings onto the text. But just being aware that I do that is helping me to get better and better at just letting the text speak for itself. It's important that we seek to understand so that we can rightly divide God's word. The next area I'd like to discuss is exegetical theology. This is defined as the theological study of a biblical passage within the framework of the historical, theological, cultural, and literary context of the book in which the passage is located, and including careful consideration of the way the grammar is structured within the passage. This is the difference between a topical teaching on the subject and line-by-line -line study, my friends. Many a Christian counselor has ripped a verse away from its surrounding paragraph in order to give quick advice to somebody. A good rule to always remember is when the Bible says, therefore, we want to read the whole paragraph before so that we can see what therefore is therefore. A good example of that is in Matthew 7. People love to quote that. Judge not, lest you be judged. 
Don't judge me, brother. The Bible says that we're not supposed to judge. No, it doesn't. If you read all the way down the whole paragraph to verse 5 and 6, you'll see that the Bible says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, the plank is in your eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So in that section of scripture, it's not telling us not to judge. It's telling us not to judge hypocritically. In other words, I shouldn't tell you not to cheat on your taxes if I'm cheating on mine. John 7, 24 is another, gives another example of a great uh, verse about judging that doesn't quite match up with the don't judge me bro theology. John 7, 24 says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So we can see from the Bible that we are to judge, but righteously and not as hypocrites. Systematic theology. This is what originally I started with back in 2006 when I became a Christian. That got me so hooked because it was, I had questions. And from that very first theology book, Practical Christian Theology, that Floyd Barothman um, wrote that I talked about in my introduction trailer, I was like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. So this section of theology, this systematic theology is really, really important to me. So systematic theology is defined as the analysis of biblical data within a structure compromised of theological subject areas or categories. And we're going to be going over each of those main systematic theology points later on in this video. So systematic theology takes all of the teaching from all over the Bible on a certain subject to tell us what scripture says as a whole about that subject. Now I'd like to discuss integrative theology, and that is defined as the formulation of an integrative biblical response to a given problem or issue, such as how does the sovereign grace of God interact with human responsibility? Or how do we count for the imperfections and failures of persons created in God's image to be the noblest beings in God's world? This area of integrative theology is great for answering questions that people have. I love it when people ask me questions about God. I like to try and give them the best God-honoring answer that I can. And sometimes the answer is, I don't know, but I'll research it and find out. Many a radio station time block has fascinatingly occupied uh, pastors on the hot seat. People get to call in with their questions about God. I like to listen because I still have a few questions myself. It's fun to see how the questions are answered. Sometimes we nail it. And sometimes we don't. This just reminds me that Christian leaders are on the same journey that we're all on. They're just like us. So we need to pray for our leaders every day. So now I'm going to go over the traditional systematic theology subject areas, which are categories. So as we have seen, systematic theology is the separation of theology into different categories gathered from all over the Bible. The following list is of the traditional subject areas and a brief list of some of the subjects I'll try to address in each one. So number one, theology proper or paterology is the study of God the Father. In this exciting area of study, we find the personality of God, 
the existence of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness and justice of God, the mercy of God, and the love of God. Number two is Christology. In Christology, we find the study of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We find that Jesus is the Son of God. We also have the virgin birth, the humanity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension and exaltation of Jesus, and the promise of the return of Jesus for his bride. Pneumatology, number three, is the study of God the Holy Spirit. This empowering section of study brings us face to face with the third person of the Trinity. We learn about the personality of the Holy Ghost, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the attributes of the Holy Spirit, names of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and ways that we can offend the Holy Spirit. Number four is soteriology. That is the study of salvation. In soteriology, we learn about repentance, being saved by grace through faith, how to walk in new life, and the importance of being born again, genuinely. Christians have different views and like to squabble over technicalities in this area regarding predestination, free will, Calvinism, or lack of, Arminianism, can you keep your salvation under any circumstances, is it possible to lose it, and things of that nature. And a lot of these different sides are all trying to put God into a a neat little box and tie it up with a bow. So they're all focusing on one faucet of, of God. And so they start to squabble with each other. But we'll have some future videos coming, uh, talking about that in the future. Ecclesiology is the study of the church, number five. We learn in this area the definition of what the church is, how the church was founded, how to be a member, baptism, regeneration, the Apostles' Doctrine, the Lord's Supper, Evangelism, and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Eschatology, number six, is the study of end times. This study gives us a taste of what we have to look forward to. We learn about the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the righteous, the resurrection of the wicked, the judgments, rewards, and eternal destiny. This is another area that's hotly debated, and Christians like to squabble over things like the timing of the rapture, premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, panmillennialism, and things of that nature. I'll have some specific videos coming up on those in the future. We are all trying to figure things out based on what the Bible says, and there's a lot of charts that are read onto the Bible. It's really cool when you actually just take scripture and let the, your eschatology come from what's just coming out of scripture. Number seven is angelology. This is the study of angels. This area of study teaches us something totally different than what I was taught growing up about angels. <laughs> we learned that angels are created. They're spirit beings. They can take physical form when it serves God's purposes. They're powerful and mighty. They're not like the effeminate pictures that we're used to. <laughs> they have rank, they have order, they have a he heavenly ministry at God's throne and an earthly ministry for people. Number eight, demonology. This is the study of demons. In this fascinating but sad study, we learn about, we learn that one third, a whole third of the angelic beings got kicked out of heaven along with Satan. We are taught about the timing of their fall, the cause of their fall, the various ranks and orders of the fallen angels, that demons are created spirit beings, and that demons are wicked spirits. How they seek to separate us from God by tempting us to do bad things and ultimately reject Jesus Christ. They're lying spirits. Oftentimes you hear about people trying to contact their dead relatives. I can guarantee you that's not their dead relative that they're contacting. That's a lying spirit impersonating their relative in an attempt to deceive them. Number nine is anthropology. Anthropology is the study of man. This study tells us the truth about who we are. We're created in the image and likeness of God. We learn about our fallen sinful nature. 
the results of the fall itself, Adam and Eve, and various people groups from around the world. Number 10 is Hamar theology. This is the study of sin. We learn where sin came from. We sometimes sin on purpose, without, sometimes we sin without meaning to. By committing a wrong or failing to do something that we should do, we sin. You know, there's a teaching going around in the church today that the law is nailed to the cross. No, the sacrifice has changed because we have a perfect sacrifice in Christ Jesus. But God's law stands. Not one jot or tittle will go away from God's law. Anytime we break the Ten Commandments, we sin against God. But we have a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. So we learn about the different kinds of sin, how to fight sin, that we should pray to God before we get tempted to sin, that we should pray for deliverance from sin, God's prescription to save us from sin, how to be forgiven when we sin, and the future when sin and death will be no more. I look forward to the day in eternity when my sin nature gets removed. You're probably not even going to be able to recognize me. It's going to be great. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. God bless you. And I will be posting more videos in the very near future.